this 1941 painting of a Buddhist monument near Lonavla, India, was Hebar's first major recognition as an artist of national standing. This gold medal awarded by the Academy of Fine Arts, Kolkata, gave him the confidence to pursue the path which was not traditional, especially in pre-independent India. One of the works that several generations of budding artists graduating from the Sir JJ School of Art have access to is Hepar's Cattle Mart, painted in 1942. It is a village fair where people come to buy and sell livestock. Hebar remembers this vivid scene from his childhood memories and transforms the chaos associated with the event into an orderly rhythm of simplified curves and colors. The theme is very Indian and the approach modern. My boy, this is your handwriting. Go ahead, what more do you get in Europe? My search is to find the inner beauty of the object. While painting a flower, for example, I would try to depict the fragrance of the flower besides its shape and color. Here, Hebar is obviously referring to Lavanya, which translates as grace, one of the seminal factors in the art of representation in ancient India. Indeed, the sages that wrote the Chitra Sutra, a 10th century treatise on art, decreed that the use of grace Lavanya Yojanam was as essential as capturing the features of a persona in a portrait. In the oils by K.K. Heber, music flows in colorful harmony towards the spectator, giving him a feeling of the mysterious. Heber's works have certain distinctive qualities, such as linear rhythm, special harmony and expressive colors. The themes he chooses are earthy and commonplace, but his penetrating insight, sensitive temperament and consummate craftsmanship transform them into sublime itself. He was one of the mentors to the Baroud Art School when it started on a very modern educational program. He was an admirable artist and a great friend. Hebar always pursued his art with a definite uh, philosophy and a direction of his own. If you look at his works, uh, the earlier attempts uh, of, of his creations, we will find uh, he painted more like a folk artist. Because there was a lot of folk elements in his works which he has uh, very uh, meticulously worked and made them to look more contemporary than any other contemporary artist at that time. But in, in later years, uh, his works spoke a very different language. Th th those works were more bold and uh, more focused on to contemporary subjects, uh, where he was uh, talking about, uh, he was narrating about the empathy he had for the downtrodden and uh, people like that. These works almost bordered to abstraction. And he tried to bring a synthesis between abstraction and uh, a figuration in which he was very successful. Dr. Hebar's versatility in attempting many forms of arts is generally reflected in his uh, great murals which he has created and also some of the um, steel sculptures he has created uh, that can be mounted on the wall. But the most important fact and striking um, point about these works are that uh, like his paintings, he has retained uh, the roots that is very much Indian in his works. Kattingeri Krishna Hebar was born in the year 1911 in Kattingeri, 400 kilometers from Bangalore, India. Hebar made his first foray into the artistic realm by scribbling the dramatic moments of his little world on the mud-plastered wall 
He used homemade charcoal, probably burnt wood, used for cooking at home. In the earlier days when Hebbar was still uh, living very close to Odipi, he would make, uh, he was, he lived in utter poverty and very often he said he ne never had food to eat and would go and take his food from his aunt. And he always promised them that he would return this vegetables the next day. In return he would come back and he would make replicas of these very vegetables from clay and paint them to look like brinjal, lady fingers and so on and go the next day and give it to them. When he was in his teens, he made his first investment in art. He bought an oleograph of Raja Ravi Varma's Saraswati. It is indeed typical of the man that the first artwork that he purchased was a depiction of the goddess of learning. He went on to make an enlarged version of the print on the walls of his living room. After graduating from school, he went to CAVA, the art section of the Chamarajendra Technical Institute in Mysore. He was sorely disappointed in the uninspiring state of teaching there. He decided to return home to his mother at Udupi. However, the inner urge to express himself through colour took him to Bombay. He felt that painting offered the only key to his creative dilemma. It was the only way that he could be entirely satisfied. The year was 1933. He studied art in the morning at Nutan Kalavidya Mandir, a studio run by Mr. Dandavati Mat, and worked at a photographic studio during the rest of the day to earn his livelihood. However, he was once again exposed to the outdated system of art education patterned after the Royal Academy in London. He got married to Sushila, a girl from his native. She had been the mainstay that had held a rather demanding husband with humongous tasks, challenges and purpose in place. It was only in 1937 when he joined the Sir JJ School of Art that he was exposed to Indian art. He has commented about the dichotomy of studying Indian traditions in the Victorian atmosphere of the school. You must look into the world rather than look at the world. Charles Girard encouraged Hebar to find his individual mode of expression rather than facilely following the academic route. Girard's words were to be a turning point in his career as a student of art. Hebar graduated with flying colors in 1939. He decided to implement the suggestion, giving up making sketches from life. He began using gouache and tempera on paper and painting from memory. For a few years after graduation, Hebar taught at the JJ school while exhibiting his works regularly across India. It was in the summer of 1946 that Hebar undertook a study tour to South India. He traversed the length of Kerala, making sketches of Kathakali dancers and local festivals. He was reminded of Yakshagana when he saw the colourful costumes and painted grimaces of the Kathakali performers. In Kerala, he was immediately reminded of Paul Gauguin's brilliant work in Brittany. He was impressed by the clashing contrast of lush green fields against the stark white-clad, brown-skinned people. This impression is beautifully captured in sunny south, rendered like a dynamic frieze of buxom figures posing with their pots and umbrellas against the rich red soil. The Kerala series were painted using both tempera and watercolours. Hebbar introduced a subtle shading in the highly stylized figures. To maidenhood, a procession of a young girl coming of age is inspired by the composition of the cave paintings at Ajunta. It won him the coveted gold medal of the Bombay Art Society. The main protagonist is symbolically painted fairer than the other peripheral characters who surround her protectively. Hebar gained national recognition after his win. His works were reproduced in a large-sized deluxe Nalanda edition, a rare achievement for any artist of that period. He was also pleasantly surprised to receive a princely sum of Rs 2,500 from the Government of Independent India. In 1949, he decided to sail to Europe 
to broaden his horizon and witness firsthand the way modern art was shaping in the West. He studied Impressionism for a term at the Académie Julian under Professor Cavalle, a follower of the Bonar School. Though Hebar studied the European technique, he produced an Indian miniature style composition of two-dimensional quality and narrative structure for the annual competition, keeping Rouault's advice in mind. No wonder then that his composition won him a prize of honor at Académie Julian. On his return from Europe, my father decided that he would no longer continue with a teaching job and that was very challenging for him because he had come back with a lot of ideas, a lot of which he had to filter and make his own. He was exposed to Western art, he has already seen Indian art, he had taught at JJ and now was the time for him to st step forward and that was the most critical point of his life. He did not want, as others felt, that he copied Amrita Shergale and no, these were all influences that had come into his mind because of his travels, because of the things that he was exposed to at that point of time. And in 1951, when we had some problems and uh, we had no place to go, it was a friend of his, a dear, dear friend, who offered him a bungalow in Mahableshwar and requested him, why don't you go there with your family, spend a year away from all the city's bustle and hustle so that you can concentrate on your work and come up with new ideas. And I followed him everywhere he went. He used to go around the streets of Mahableshwar, look up at the Sayadri mountains, look at the villagers and the cows and the goats. And it was a typical village life. And he had grown up himself in a village in Kattingeri in South Canara. And to him, it brought back those old memories. He would take his sketch back and go everywhere, go on sketching. And I would just follow him and see what he's doing. Once he got back to his studio, he would get back to his easel and start painting. Post Mahableshwar, my father started once again thinking how he should deal with a blank canvas how he can approach a canvas uh, with the old ideas of landscape, portrait painting and the uh, European, the British academic style. How could he could look at the same style and make it his own. And that is how he, his approach was towards landscape. Some of the paintings he did of that period like uh, Mahim Darga, uh, Kisan, the farmer, uh, these are the ones that won the national award at the Lalitkala Academy. For three consecutive years, he was a winner. And if you look at those works, you find that they are not true landscapes. They are not landscape in the sense of an academic landscape. But they are landscape because they speak of the land, they speak of the people whom he loved very much. Hampi, in Hebbar's native state of Karnataka, was an important part of the Vijayanagara Empire. There are glowing reports dating to the 16th century from foreign travelers about the grandeur and glory of the temples and secular buildings constructed by Krishna Devaraya, the greatest of all Vijayanagara monarchs. The intricate details of the architecture and the sculptural decoration were already evolving from the Veshara temple styles of Halebid and Belur. When Hebbar visited Hampi in 1961, the magnificent city was in ruins, giving him the idea of narrating Indian mythological stories through the broken sculptures. He named this series Saga in Stone, using the sculptural shapes over the following years to describe the myths of various regions, including the Inca and Angorvat ruins. The stone inscriptions influenced him as much as the figures did. This is clearly visible in one of his rare political paintings, The Birth of Bangladesh, where he has two running friezes of figures. They are reminiscent of the decorative base of the Hampi temples, with the lower strip showing the refugees fleeing to India, and the upper showing the liberated people returning triumphantly to the country. The late 50s and early 60s saw man conquering a brand new frontier space. Hebbar, like many others, became fascinated by this. His increasing thrust towards abstraction was perfectly suited to exploring this new theme, that of man 
going into space. Rocket is one of the first paintings in this series which also included Aspiration, Birth of Moon and Galaxy among others. The Birth of Moon shows an orange orb bursting out of a bleak sky. The terrain is rugged and hostile. The environment seems inhospitable and hardly right for a birth. Slowly, almost imperceptibly, his works began taking on a spiritual character. The emotions and moods that he tried to imbue into the paintings of the Mahabaleshwar retreat now have a supernatural beauty that is best seen in homage to sun and moon. But I was, uh, you know, very influenced by his uh, drawings and uh, the lot of, lot of simplicity and the way, uh, you know, explore the lines uh, which really attracted me. I also learnt a lot and, you know, uh, and Hebar was a man like that and I, I try to emulate a little bit of his qualities if possible. Hebar first visited Goa in 1982 and kept visiting Goa after this, capturing the heartwarming essence of the place in many paintings. This painting, simply titled Goa, is zen-like in its simplicity and clarity of vision. The straight red road and the azure sea are abstract accents in the vastness of the green countryside. Small wonder then that it was immediately acquired for the Fukuoka Museum in Japan. In this painting, the Veena seems to be dissolving into pure waves of sound. He let music flood his entire being and grasped it with his eye even more than his ears. Hebar has painted several types of performers, be they musicians, dancers or folk theatre artists. But more than the musicians, it is music itself that inspired him to paint. While traditional miniature painting in India has several folios dedicated to music known as the Ragamala paintings, they are the visual personifications of the music. These traditional ragamalas had to be depicted according to the rules set down not only by the musicians but also by the artist. Hebbar, on the other hand, was to paint music through the use of colour. He was substituting colour and line for note and rhythm. The first painting in this series, Homage to Music, does have the musicians depicted in a corner of the canvas. The major part of the canvas, however, is filled with waves of vibrant colour suggesting sound through their lyrical undulation. Hebar was inspired to do this work after listening to the performance of Yehudi Menuhin has stated that he was inspired to express sound through colours by the music of the violinist. Musicians are so insignificant compared to their music. This for me is a discovery, a discovery in dimension. For an artist, this discovery is a continuous process, a quest for something deeper. Hebar's interest in music and dance led him to study the subject at close quarters. In order to truly understand the rhythm and cadence of the dancers that he interpreted on canvas, he actually studied Kathak for over two years. The lyricism and soothing quality of Indian music the grace and rhythmic quality of Indian dance inspired him to express his feelings in line and colour. While drawing dancers, he drew directly with his pen, eliminating the details but stressing the rhythmic aspect. In addition, he was also captivated by the dance forms of all the places he visited. Thus, we have the series on the Balinese dancers with their pitch-whirled headdresses and long gold-painted nails. In fact, there are points of commonality among these various cultures, ranging from the gestures to the predilection for elaborate costumes.
the colorful open air drama and the bombastic posturing of the yakshagana actors had mesmerized him right from his childhood these performances generally began in the twilight hours and continued far into the night lit only by the flickering torches the strong shadows cast by these rustic men magnified by their multi-layered costumes cast a spell on hebbar holding him enthralled in a way the exposure and interest in the dance forms of other states and countries kept reminding him of his native dance form in addition to being a fine draftsman he was also an excellent portraitist the fact that most official portraits done for the government of india were commissioned from him speaks for itself Be it Maulana Abul Kalam Azad or President Shankar Dayal Sharma, he captures the very soul of his model with his near impressionistic brush strokes and shimmering highlights. His portraits of family members and friends gives us an intimate insight into their character. We get to know the person despite never meeting them in flesh. As he captured the fragrance of a flower rather than the mere appearance of it. The paint itself has remained as fresh and dewy as the day on which Hebbar placed it exactly on her features and her hair. Hebbar was rather close to his mother. He constantly refers to her throughout his career, painting her on several occasions, even including her in genre works. His 1945 portrait of his mother, despite being quite realistic in portraying the careworn face and the tonsured head of a widow, shows the influence of miniature painting in the placement of the red-clad head against the near blank background. Though there is a certain amount of shading in the veiled drapery, the strong yellow border outlines the red-colored area, making the painting appear linear and two-dimensional rather than spatial. His aim was to achieve the maximum with the minimum lines. Hebbar had discovered the hidden beauty in the interplay of lines. His line drawings are governed by emotional urge and rhythmic movement rather than by rules of conventional representations. These drawings speak of Hebbar's absolute supremacy in the graphic field with an all-pervading rhythm captured in simple ease of free-flowing line. The sobriquet given by Dr. Mulkraj Anand to his drawings, the singing line, is particularly apt when one sees his drawings of dancers. It is as Hebbar's pen has a mind of its own, dancing over the wide stage of the paper, performing intricate chakras, the signature spins of Kathak, before finally freezing into a well-remembered pose. Everywhere in relation to mature painting, which may be considered as the intricate process in which many strands of emotion and technical virtuosity enter the drawings retain a certain element of spontaneity the thing is seen the memory image is brooded over under the surface of the emotion and then perhaps the hand compels hebbar to trace the germinating expression into the world of space transferring the flow of the blood onto the mirror of recognition Hebbar was often branded as a painter with a social conscience. This is in part to his choice of subjects, picking up insights from the marginalized people that he saw on the streets. He sympathizes with them, looking into their world with a benign eye, indulgently capturing their few moments of happiness, huddling around for a chat at times or curling up for an uncomfortable night's sleep. As in his portraits, these outcasts speak with their eyes rather than their gestures. He drew this inspiration in part from his own days of toil when he had to struggle for a living in order to pay first for his tuition and then to look after his young family. Yeah, Heber was bold and unafraid to try out new things, to experiment. He always asserted that uh, I belong to no school. I am myself. It is this enormous confidence and belief in himself and his abilities that uh, uh, gave him a, a lot of satisfaction in whatever he did. The attitude of giving symbolic significance 
to the world of reality has been his conscious or unconscious complex all the while. In this painting, he tried to express his joy over the shimmering effect of swinging water overflowing from the huge reservoir. The flow of water in the middle of the canvas takes the form of the waterfall. This could be compared to life symbolically. As for him, it is an expression of joy. He was a reformer when he came in the late 70s as the chairman of the Karnataka Lalitakala Academy. He introduced a lot of reforms that totally changed the face of the Karnataka Lalitakala Academy's activities. That one of the most important factors that he has uh, uh, introduced in Karnataka was sending the art students to uh, universities like Shantini Gethin, uh, Baroda, MS University, etc which has paved the way for a greater development among the younger artists. Many of them today are internationally acclaimed artists and the credit goes to uh, Hebar alone. However, the best example of his portraiture came towards the end of his life when he painted himself as an autumn leaf rather than as a person. The leaf, though fallen away from the life-giving tree, is still magnificent in its brown and gold. With this painting at one fell stroke, Hebbar straddles the abstract with the real world. I have traced the progression of my imagery from the academic to near abstraction. My works are generated by my intense feeling of the environment. I seek to find myself and follow it to wherever it leads me. Thus continues my voyage in images.